Hello, and welcome everyone to what I believe is going to be the most incredible conversation of Davos. And it's not just because of the panelists that are here, but it's because of all of you in the audience. And I hope that we can save a little bit of time at the end to include your voices, just to give us a few quick hits on what you're thinking or questions. But we are here for the pathways to economic mobility through racial equity, an incredibly, incredibly timely topic and one that must continue no matter what the narrative is in the outside world. When we leave Davos, we have to go back and listen, whether it's through social media or through other, the newspapers or just in conversations, this narrative that doesn't want to talk about this very important issue. So recent years have seen progress in workforce representation for people of color, with 94% of jobs added by S&P 100 companies in the US in 2021 taken up by people of color. Yet, systemic economic gaps still need to be addressed. What are the promising pathways for accelerating fairer economic outcomes? This session is linked to the World Economic Forum's Racial Justice in Business Alliance. So it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. To my far right is a wonderful woman who is now one of my new besties, Luana Ozamela. She is the Vice President and Chief Impact Officer for iFood. Luana uh, is a, a, an incredible power in Brazil. iFood is the leading food tech company in Latin America with over 70 million monthly deliveries and around 300,000 registered restaurants. iFood is a major player in this industry. Prior to joining iFood, Luana worked at the Inter-American Development Bank and Hewlett Packard. In 2023, Bloomberg Linnea recognized her as one of the 500 most influential leaders in Latin America, and in 2024, LinkedIn named her a top voice in economic uh, de development, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You go, girl. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, so, my other bestie, Although I will say, she always gives me a hard time. I'm telling oh you, God. always. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce Shamina Singh, who is the founder and president for the Center for Inclusive Growth and the Impact Fund with MasterCard. So she is um, where it all happens when it comes to social impact and phil philanthropy. She's also the executive vice president of sustainability and serves as a member of the company's management committee. Shamina is the executive sponsor of the Pride Business Resource Group and co-chairs the advisory board of the Ad Council of America. She is a board member of ADL, an anti-hate organization, and additionally, she is an alumna of the WEF Young Global Leaders Program and a Henry Crown Fellow with the Aspen Institute, which is where we met. As are you. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, and do you want to be my bestie? I <laughs> I'd hate to leave you out. Yeah, I, like, I don't want to be left out. <laughs> okay, so we don't want to leave out Robert C. Garrett, who is the CEO of Hackensack Meridian Health in New Jersey. Um, Hackensack Meridian Health is the largest healthcare network in New Jersey. The network comprises 18 hospitals, 500 patient care locations, 7,000 physicians, and 36,000 team members. Mr. Garrett's exceptional leadership has led to significant advancements in medical education, behavioral health care, cancer care, and research and innovation in the network. So let's get started. I want to thank all of you that are joining us also via live stream. Um, we are just have a, about 45 minutes to really talk very seriously about um, this work around racial equity, business practices. And I want to say it's a pleasure to be able to do that here at WEF and to be back in Davos. My experience has been, and I'm, I've only been here two times, but my limited experience has been that it's an honor and a privilege to be in the room with people like all of you, to have these really incredible discussions, to learn from each other, to make new friends, and to know how can we take back the bright spots that you all are actually implementing where you are to our parts of the world. 
So we have a great panel. I'm going to stop talking and just let you all share your wisdom. But I want to um, just say a few things because I think it's important that number one, it's within each of our power to break this, this cycle of generational poverty. It's a choice. And if we make the right decisions today, it will impact generations to come. Unfortunately, previous generations have not taken this on in a manner that it should be. And so that's why we're seeing so much in terms of economic disparities around the world. But I think that we can today, if we choose to, just a small group of committed individuals make the difference. We want to discuss how multinational companies and organizations can maintain progress around racial and ethnic equity through pathways to economic mobility by addressing challenges and solutions at the local, regional, and global levels. Again, highlighting those bright spots, those lighthouses, those best practices that we can learn from. So with that, what I'd like to do is to just ask a general question, and um, Luana, if you want to jump in uh, and start the, the conversation. But the question really is, what um, has been the overall progress and lingering challenges in achieving economic and social mobility for people of color worldwide when considering various social, economic, financial, and policy-based factors? Yeah, it's Challenging. a big question. That's a big question. A big I question. know, it's loaded. Yeah, so I think one interesting perspective that I'll bring is how companies uh, that have made its core business to promote racial equity and equality, how could that happen? How does that look like? And I suppose one of the challenges that we see is diversity washing that I see very often. And the challenge of diversity washing is not just, it's essentially I would summarize as a disconnection between talking and acting, right? And actually doing transformational things. And it's, it's that particular point that I feel is central for companies that really want to create a culture of equity, diversity, and inclusion and make it core business. So in the case of the opportunities that we have seen, education, technology, and financial markets, promoting that in those three main sectors is the greatest opportunity that I have seen so far. Education, because just give you an example, Brazil is mainly people of color, 56% of the population. Um, our ecosystem, iFood ecosystem, which is considered uh, a company that is a food tech company, the largest food tech company, we have one million delivery workers, one million drivers, delivering one billion deliveries per annum. Seven out of 10 are people of color, men and women. So we are, what we are, and when we look at the restaurants, we have 350,000 establishments, of which we estimate 40% are people of color and women. So if we do want our business to grow, our consumer base to be happy and satisfied and purchase more, we need to tackle inequalities, racial and social inequalities. So what we have seen in education, in, uh, in uh, AI and technology and financial markets, and why financial markets? People used to talk a lot about entrepreneurship, black entrepreneurship. I talk about financial markets because what we need to promote entrepreneurship and to help building wealth in black communities is actually black investors. And investors who are really committed to saying my portfolio is gonna promote racial equity. And when we look at the sizable influence of financial market, having more than four trillion in assets under management, look at the sizable opportunity of actually promoting racial equity. So there are many opportunities, but I think these three main areas, education, because we simply need, we know that when we look at all the racial gaps, particularly in Latin America, most of it is because what we call the educational gap. Dropout rates, 53% are people of color. 
So, and when we look at technology, 29 million of, uh, of people are disconnected from Wi-Fi in, in Brazil, vast majority, people of color. If we are talking about future jobs, we, are, we, we have to look at that. People are still disconnected from speed internet. So all those issues, if we do uh, focus on those main root causes, the, the causes of the disconnect of social inequality from um, economic inequality. And every day, I always remember the words this week, uh, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King uh, would have turned 95 years of age. And for him, there was no civil rights movement without an economic right as a f turning into a fundamental right. And I believe truly in that. That is wonderful. And I'm going to say that you set it up for Shamina to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can jump in because I actually think you do. I think you did, and um, and congratulations to you on all of your success. And Angela, thank, thank you. you so much for for moderating the panel. I, you read all of our bios. You didn't talk about what you do, which is such an important pathway to prosperity for everyone. Which is you are the global CEO of the United Way Worldwide, which yes. is the connection to all communities around the world. Um, so thank you for your, your, your leadership. Welcome. Building on what Luana said, I mean, I think the way that you know, we approach this uh, as a private sector entity, as a multinational company, is by doing what we do best. And what do we do best? We compete, we create, and we catalyze. We compete, and that's competition. So what we want to do is we're creating, we want to compete on incentives for a race to the top. That means we want the best talent, we want the best employees, we want to create the best environment so we can deliver the best business returns. And what does that mean? It means innovation and inclusion are two sides of the same coin for us. That's how we compete. That's how we create business value. And that's the second thing we do is, what do we do? We create business value. We create opportunities for our company to succeed through products, through programs, through services. It makes good business sense to have an inclusive environment and have diversity at our core. The third thing is catalyze. What do we do? We catalyze innovation. And like I said before, innovation and inclusion are two sides of the same coin. That's the only way that we remain competitive. How do we do it? Through community. We build community of influencers on the front lines of inclusive growth. That's what the Center for Inclusive Growth does at MasterCard. And what do we see as the biggest opportunity? by providing and building on capabilities. The capabilities that we're providing right now, that we're looking at right now, have to do with the theme of Davos here today, and that's all about AI and technology. How are we ensuring that the capabilities provided or created by this evolution, I wouldn't even say it's a revolution yet, are ensuring that all communities have access to the resources they need to thrive in a digital economy? Because in the end of the day, Inclusion without inclusive growth that doesn't scale doesn't make a difference. Thanks. And, and so I want to now just shift to this other sector, healthcare, mm -hmm. because um, as Shamina said, I'm with United Way Worldwide, and we focus on health, education, economic mobility, and disaster response and climate. But healthcare is fundamental, and access to healthcare is fundamental to how people can actually thrive. And so can you talk a little bit about what you're doing with your company? Sure, thank you, and thank, thank you for having me. This is a, uh, I agree with you, this is a great panel and it's an honor to be with you as well, Angela. Uh, yeah, there's a lot going on in the healthcare space uh, with respect to um, equality and uh, really equal access to, uh, to healthcare. And I agree with, uh, with what was said already. I, I really believe the, um, the social inequities are synonymous with, um, with, with racial inequities in, in so many ways. And we have to address these social issues. And education is a good example. And you know, I'm, I'm straying out of healthcare just for a minute, but we, were, we, we also have a, a medical school uh, as part of our health system. 
And um, I was so distressed uh, when the Supreme Court decision came out and uh, struck down affirmative action because it really sets back. Um, here we had a, a, a brand new medical school that was um, really believed in diversity, equity, and inclusion. We, we had a very, um, you know, certainly a very good admissions process that promoted DE&I. And you know now it's you know the lawyers are looking at this and the lawyers are looking at that uh, because of the Supreme Court decision and you know it just I feel like it, it really sets us back. But going back to health equity um, and uh, Luana quoted Dr. King and I, I want to quote Dr. Martin Luther King as well because he said um, the the biggest or the largest inequity is actually the lack of access for um, for equal health care. Yes. And I think in a lot of ways that is true. So we are seeing a lot of um, disparities in healthcare um, outcomes. And I'll just give you a couple statistics. Um, certainly around the globe, um, there is as much as a 30-year life expectancy disparity depending on what country you're in. So in some of the developing countries, 30 years less uh, life uh, on average, which is really, really disturbing. Um, during the uh, COVID pandemic, um, people of color were two times more likely um, to die from uh, COVID-19 than their, uh, their, their white counterparts. Um, <clears throat> maternal deaths are three times as uh, likely in, um, in women of color. Um, so those kinds of statistics are, are, are incredibly bothersome. So what we've done at our, our organization, Hackensack Meridian Health, is we have made um, healthcare equity one of our, our seven top strategic priorities because our mission is to transform healthcare. I don't see how you can achieve that mission if you don't address healthcare inequalities. So what we've done is we have a screening uh, tool. So anybody who comes in contact with a, um, a uh, Hackensack Meridian Health site gets screened for one or more of the social determinants of health. That might mean um, housing, um, transportation. Housing, you know, unstable housing is, uh, is not a, um, a good position to be in if you're going to be a healthy person or you're going to be um, being able to access health care. Transportation, getting to and from your, your physician's office, your primary care physician's office is another uh, major issue. Food and food insecurity. So many people living in food deserts and not getting healthy food. So we're screening, and we have screened over, in just a little over a year and a half, we've screened over a million people. But even more important, we have made 3.5 million referrals for those people to get help. Uh, whether it's at Hackensack Meridian Health or at other um, agencies, community resource groups. So we're, we're, I'm feeling like we are getting at some of this, um, this inequality and um, some of these disparities that we, uh, we see out there. The other thing that, um, that we're really proud of at Hackensack Meridian Health is really having a strong um, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, program. It was actually ranked number one amongst healthcare providers um, this past year, which we're, we're really proud of. And we have, we have active team member resource groups that have literally changed the culture of the or organization in so many ways. We've seen our um, employee engagement go up by uh, 20 to 25 percent since our DEI program uh, was um, instituted. And those groups have made such great, great suggestions. So as an example, our African-American team member resource group uh, said for them it was really important that we added a, a benefit uh, for um, a doula benefit for uh, birthing mothers. And um, so that didn't just benefit that group, that benefited the entire employee population and it made such great sense. Um, our uh, pride group uh, made a suggestion uh, that um, I, IVF uh, be, um, be reimbursed at a, at a higher level. It was very important to that particular team member resource group. We adopted that. That benefited the whole organization. So my point is that you know, when, you, when you really are practicing diversity, equity, and inclusion, it just doesn't benefit that particular group. It benefits the whole. Everybody's um, boat rises. Yes. So I, I'm tying a couple of themes together. Um, when you, what triggered for me was when you said, ta mentioned the, the uh, court case, which now is um, causing a lot of companies to back down with respect to DEI and how they're pursuing it for fear of being sued, and that's that's a real fear. And then I look at again your example of COVID, and I'll speak from the U.S. perspective of how many. Black and brown people did not want to go to the hospital or did not have access to healthcare or didn't want to take the vaccine 
for a number of reasons. And one of the initiatives that I did, um, I was with another organization prior to United Way, was to say, well, why don't we get healthcare workers that look like the people they're trying to mm -hmm. serve, mm -hmm. that speak the language of the people that they're trying to serve to engender trust? And so when we have uh, lawsuits and things that start chipping away at this conversation that we're having, then it's going backwards, not forwards. Yeah, and if I could just add one thing, you know, on the on that, you know, I mentioned we have a uh, a medical school. Mm -hmm. Do you know in 1980, I think the statistic was um, only seven percent of all physicians in America were um, African American males. The statistic in 2024 is seven percent. So 1980 to 2024, it has it it hasn't moved, and we were starting to make really good progress when the affirmative action decision came down. Yeah. And Shimmy, I want to talk to you just about access to capital because we're talking about economic mobility. Mm -hmm. and, and so what are you seeing in, in your role and how is MasterCard? I would love for you to give some specific examples of how you're really tackling this because there are some learnings that I think people in the room and other companies can, can, can learn even if they're not in the financial services industry. No, I think it's a I think it's a great question, and the other and I think the other piece of this is that it's also a global issue. And so, right. when you're a multinational, mm -hmm. you think about things uh, certainly um, locally, but also globally. And so, I think in terms of the the economic mobility, I talked before about the capability, and there are two things that I think are really interesting to think about here. On the economic mobility front, um, Mastercard has been doing inclusion. Um, since the beginning, financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. So what we recognized early on um, was that the world was going digital mm -hmm. before I joined MasterCard. And in order for anybody to succeed in the digital economy, you have to be included in yes. the economy. Um, more often than not, people of color and disenfranchised communities and women were, for, were not included and haven't been included in the economy. Um, that didn't work from a business perspective for MasterCard. So we started an initiative where we actually made a commitment to bring um, 500 million people into the formal economy around the world. And during COVID, when the height of digital was, you know, when, when we really started to see people suffer um, because they weren't being included in the digital economy, we doubled down on our commitment. And we said, we're going to bring a billion people into the formal economy. So that made us take... its. It, one, it, became, it, it has been part of our business strategy. We know how to do it. And it ends up uh, creating much more equitable business practices. And so to your point around some specifics, we have a global program that we call Strive. And Strive is a program that is about building small business growth all around the world. Um, what do small businesses need? Uh, they need to go digital. They need to get capital and they need to grow their networks. What, what does MasterCard have? We're digital, we have a lot of data and data capacity, and we have the biggest network in the world. And so when we turn, set our sights on creating an inclusive economy and focusing on financial inclusion, especially for small businesses, we start to, we start to see real change and make a real difference. And so I think that's one big, one big point of um, progress that I think we should point out is that the focus on small business and small business owners, the vast majority are women mm -hmm. and people of color around the world. And so I think when you focus on small business and you focus on increasing um, job stability and, and, and economic growth for small business owners, you end up creating an economy that really does start to work for everyone. That's great. And Luana, it, even your your business, iFood, and mm -hmm. um, we call it like the gig economy with mm -hmm. the drivers delivering, but it's allowing people to be able to do things that and to have access to generate more funds. And for various reasons, they not, may not be on a traditional job path. But talk a little bit more mm -hmm. um, about your company's intentionality in uh, making sure that the workforce is supported, uh, that they're given opportunities to, to grow, starting from being a driver to what other opportunities do they have? Yeah. So we create a lot of opportunities in the, our local economies. iFood is already responsible for half percentage point of Brazilian GDP <laughs> in terms of contribution. So when we look from that perspective of also creating 
jobs, what kind of jobs are we creating? And one of the things we quickly realized is it's not just about fair wages, which the drivers currently, 92% of the drivers receive the equivalent of the top 30% uh, earners in Brazil. Really? So it's any, it, but for us, it's not just about the wages. It's also about what are the other opportunities that we are giving our drivers to actually uh, climb the social mobility ladder, right? In Brazil, it takes nine generations for a family in the lowest income to climb to the middle income. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is by investing in education, mm -hmm. uh, we can reduce the number of generations. And one of the specific things we are doing in terms of creating those opportunities is funding uh, high school education. Today, iFoods drivers represent almost 3% of all the GED test takers in Brazil. We take uh, adults to actually complete their high school. We, we fund their preparatory courses. We pay for them to actually take the test on the day so that they don't have to work. Wow. And what we are actually doing every day, we are using the app, which is something that it's their everyday tool to stimulate for them to do training, reskilling, uh, and find other ways of actually increasing income, generating income outside food delivery. For us, it's all about social impact and social mobility through education. But we also are looking at the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We have a program called iFood Believes because we believe in black-owned business. And what we did, we, we launched this year, last year, uh, in Salvador with 300 restaurants uh, owned uh, by, by Afro-descendants. Uh, we created this program in order to give not only educational tools, teach restaurants uh, on how to make more money to be top placed. Uh, we created a list of uh, black restaurants in Bahia so that people, consumers, uh, we have 50 million consumers, so that they can also see that they can patronize, promote black money, you know, and, and, and really also uh, join iFood in the whole movement of reducing inequalities and promoting uh, racial equity. And one thing that is really interesting and innovative about uh, making this core business, as I repeat, because many companies, they do have very nice initiatives, but they are totally separate from the PL. Mm. In our case, it's inside nice. our PL. And we need to create programs that are financially sustainable mm -hmm. because otherwise tomorrow we are not going to be able to scale because we are not a philanthropy. We are a business. But at the same time, we recognize that it's possible. It's possible to have social impact. It's possible to grow. It's possible to also have make impact and make money. And I think it's only by doing that businesses will actually scale initiatives that promote uh, racial equality and racial equity. So what I am um, hearing, which you all are not saying, is that underneath all of the initiatives that you've taken, there have been a multitude of conversations at the leadership level, weighing the pros and cons and the risks of how do we move forward in doing this, how do we show up uh, if you're a public company for, with shareholders, and what does this really mean for us from an, a value standpoint of the company? So can you give us a little bit of the inside baseball on some of the conversations that you've had? And I can't say these are Chatham House rules because this is live <laughs> They're <streaming>. not. Yes. <laughs> They're not, that's okay. Yeah, well, I could I could yeah. maybe share a few. Um, so you know, when when I've gone to um, my board and I've talked about investing in health equity um, programs and diversity, equity, inclusion, not only do I say it's the right thing to do and uh, it, it we cannot fulfill our mission without it, but I also talk about the the economic benefits to our organization, mm -hmm. um, and the statistics are very very compelling. I mean, you know. Companies or organizations that really truly have um, strong diversity, equity, and inclusion programs are 20% more 
productive because they're more innovative. Uh, as I mentioned before, employees are more engaged. They're less likely to, um, to leave. Turnover is less. And in healthcare, that's a huge, huge issue in terms of workforce um, uh, stability. Even dropping to the bottom line, EBITDA um, is 10% greater, 10% greater when leadership teams are diversified. And I tell my board also, we need to represent the community that we serve. We're in one of the most diverse um, communities, one of the most diverse states in the, uh, in the nation. And I don't believe that just at the workforce level, at the, at, the, at the ground level. I mean through leadership, so we have significant leadership development programs that um, really focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I tell my board, this board needs to become more diverse as well. All right, yeah. and what's the inside response baseball. to that? It's been positive, you know, <laughs> tr truly. There ha I, I can't say there's been uh, pushback. I think some, honestly, some are probably more enthusiastic than others, but, um, but we've, we've made some strides. I would say um, certainly on leadership, certainly on our team member level, and some at the board level, but I'd like to see even more. Thank you. Shamina? You know, we have a, um, uh, the, the, the way that we built the center at MasterCard and, uh, is really about leveraging the assets of the firm for impact. And the conversations we have, I guess, are more around what does that look like and how does that take shape? Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about um, our In Solidarity program that we launched um, in the United States that has now gone global because that's really a way it focuses the company's attention um, in a way that few things do. And so the head of that program for North America is actually here in Davos, and she's She's either day Slagos. And we've learned from her that the way that you um, build economic prosperity and to black communities in particular is that you use the assets of MasterCard in a way that benefit everybody, but also target a community in a way that lifts them up. And so what do I mean by that? I mean that Salah spearheaded a, a partnership with the Bay Good Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and when, as part of that, she created another job training program for black-owned businesses, and this is what reminded me. She put those two things together because that uses the assets of MasterCard in terms of capital, but also data and data analytics and capability. And the other thing that we worked together on was understanding that data is an asset. Mm -hmm. yep. But what we found was communities, in particular in the In Solidarity program, weren't necessarily, um, it's not that they didn't have the data, but they wanted the analytics, they wanted the answer. And so we do that through the Center for Inclusive Growth, but then we also make sure that we're investing in um, colleges and universities mm -hmm. to provide the capability. Yes. Um, because if we don't work to ensure that black communities and other eth ethnically diverse communities benefit from the technology right now, we're going to be looking at a capability gap, mm -hmm. the likes of which we've never seen. And yeah. so part of that has been that we've worked with Howard University in the United States, as an example, to build out their uh, data science for social impact program with a multi-million dollar grant. But then we also went to Atlanta and identified a network of historically black colleges and universities and said, we need to infuse that with capital and with the benefit of MasterCard, um, our people and capabilities team to ensure that as students are coming out of these universities much more capable now and ready for the technology economy that we're recruiting them into the company. So when you ask about conversations and sort of under the covers and, 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 uh, and things like that, I think the conversations we have are about not necessarily um, why to do it, it's how we make the biggest impact in the way using the assets of the firm. Mm -hmm. and, but it's never a question of should mm -hmm. or why, because we know that the why is about we have to stay competitive as a multinational company. Mm -hmm. And you can't really argue with that as a board member or a shareholder. Mm -hmm. And I think we're united around that. The questions we have and the arguments we have, if any, is how do you deploy those assets yes. 
in the ways that make the most sense for the things you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and it sounds like, Luana, your yep. company has already been thinking about that and doing it with the education, the GED programs, et cetera. Yep. So are there any specific, though, challenges, challenging questions that you all have wrestled with I as a company? I, I think this issue of prioritization, yeah. uh, it's a key mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, we have focused on education mainly, not only drivers, but also society. We have helped uh, uh, train through our technological Olympics uh, and all the other programs, giving support to teachers, more than two million students in uh, public schools. So we invest significantly now is the return on investment. And I'm not talking about just the financial, the social return on investment and the returns on investment, both for us and for society. What are the things we should be doing around edu education, for example, right? Or around even uh, workers' condition that is, would be m the most significant, right? And cost effective. There are some things, for, uh, just to give you an example, we tried to venture in the past into building uh, IT infrastructure, but we realize we are not the best position for that. Right. We should focus on giving the resources to teachers. And that's when we created a, 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 a program uh, with um, uh, using WhatsApp, and we invest on learning through WhatsApp and giving tools for teachers on AI, on data science, so that they can be catalytic and they can then multiply. We, we felt this is much more effective. We can do this. We have loads of uh, AI professionals and AI models. We understand this. So let's focus on the assets, right? And on the other hand, how do we prioritize? We look at the root causes of the challenges that we face. One example, um, when we think about stereotypes and bias around uh, race in the ecosystem that we operate in, um, we know that education will solve so much for drivers in terms of uh, social mobility, even for the overall uh, uh, population, black population. However, we know that stereotype and bias is a existing and present threat to the full realization of the potential that we are creating through our investments. So how do That's a we... drop the mic sentence. Did y'all hear that? <laughs> mm. Say it again. So <laughs> bias and stereotypes is, a, is it a real threat to the realization of the potential uh, that we are investing in through education. So it demoralizes people, it limits, it, it, it affects the incentives. Um, so what we did, for example, in the case of drivers, they face about 37% about of drivers report that they faced in the last six months some sort of harassment of discrimination. Um, be by cu customer, by society in general, by restaurants. So what we decided to do is like, how do we tackle this? How do we change people's behavior yeah. so that the drivers can simply do their <laughs> daily work free of harassment and discrimination? And we decided to invest to partner with the largest network of black women lawyers. They are called sisters, black sisters in law. Uh, and, <laughs> like yes, that. and drivers, whenever they uh, face uh, a, a challenge, a situation, they are victims of discrimination, they can call the hotline, they can go to their offices. And the nice thing is that everything is online, it's through the phone. Uh, they are present, we are present in 1,700 cities, they are present in 1,000 cities. So we have actually a huge coverage of uh, legal and psychological support. And it's amazing how much drivers want to take the psychological support wow. because of specifically this issue of um, uh, bias and discrimination. So for us, we do not shy away of the hard problems. We know that we cannot uh, change uh, the society as a whole in terms of how they view uh, the black population or, or the different bias, but we know we can invest in education to accelerate mobility and we can give the support that people need in order to seek their rights. That's incredible. So, 
I want to thank you all, uh, but now it's you all's turn in the audience. Um, we <laughs> so all these hands went up, and uh, we only have about four minutes, which means that uh, let's do this as a popcorn. And we, we have a mic, but, but literally just if you have a question or, or a comment, do it in 30 seconds so we can get as many people's voices in this conversation. Thank you. Absolutely. And introduce yourself and where you're from. Yes, my name is Robert Beamish. I'm a global shaper based in the Ottawa Hub. Thank you for this presentation. Um, we're at Davos, public and private conversation, the forum, the opportunity for that dialogue. We've heard a lot on the private side. What's the role of the public sector in advancing racial equity? I'll take that one. As the CEO of United Way Worldwide, which is one of the largest uh, privately funded nonprofits in the world, operating in 37 countries, we have the role in being great partners and filling the gaps where the government doesn't step in. And, and also, if we're partnering with corporations, being that connector and saying, we want to support you because your company doesn't operate without employees and employees live in communities. And you need to be aware of the conditions in which your employees live. And then have the conversation about, as, as a nonprofit, what are the services that are needed to really bring up the community? And I will tell you what, what nonprofits are really good at is going into communities as partners and not as saviors. Mm -hmm. Companies like to come in and say, I've got a great idea, let me tell you how you're gonna solve it. Nonprofits, our role is as advocates and being the voice and elevating the voices of the people that live in the community to make sure that the solutions that are created for the communities and elevating them, whether economic mobility or access to health or whatever the issues are, that the people that are most affected have a seat at the table. Can I, can I just add uh, one example to, to what you said in, in, in my world? So, um, you know, I mentioned before about um, the social determinants of health and how many people we screened. And one of the things that jumped out at, at us from the data were um, food insecurities. So um, through government funding, so this is truly a private-public partnership, um, we um, partnered with grocery stores in um, underserved communities and communities of color. And we have now provided supplemental um, we call it fresh match, um, so it's um, supplemental um, dollars on SNAP cards that, uh, that recipients receive, but the catch is they have to buy healthy foods. So it's fruits and vegetables, and almost every grocery store um, throughout the state is, is incredibly interested in partnering with us in that regard. That wouldn't have happened without state dollars and federal dollars as well. Public-private partnerships. Uh, yes, ma'am, I'll go to you. Or Oh, you have the mic, yes. Announce. Hello, my name is Debbie Smith. I'm also a global shaper. I'm from Washington, D.C. And we've talked a lot about the systemic oppression. And you mentioned the affirmative action case. I'm wondering if there's anything that your organizations are doing or could be doing at the local, state level to kind of lobby the government to help support you and move your missions forward. I, I can mention yes. something about the, the local governments. We have a very interesting initiative, and it also connects with the public-private partnerships. You know, the, the drivers are often uh, stop and frisked, right? Stop and search. Mm -hmm. And what we did, we, we um, have a partnership with the government of Sao Paulo, where most of our deliveries, a lot of it uh, happens, uh, in order to exchange data. So we created an API where the police, the state police and the local police can actually access. Uh, and as soon as they frisk one of our drivers, they let them go. So it really not only impacts the productivity of the driver, right, income, mm -hmm. uh, but also reduces the potential for harassment, bias, and all that. So this is just an example uh, of uh, a public private partnership at the local level. We also have, uh, of obviously, all our educational programs, we need to enter schools. Yeah. Uh, we need to empower the teachers. So we sign many different corporations. Um, Maratona Tech, for example, the, the Olympics, Tech Olympics we did, we had to sign cooperation yeah. and exchange data. So there is a lot on the data front, data sharing uh, with government so that uh, we can uh, continue to scale. That's excellent. Uh, we're I'm all the time. I can't take just one last question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Catherine Stickney. I'm the CEO of Parita, which is a workforce analytics platform. 
And so we measure diversity within organizations and report back insights. My, my concern is that we're a global company, but we can only get gender data outside of the US mostly. Uh, there's variations on that, some, some countries allow it. But uh, race, ethnicity is a really important thing to measure. And uh, as soon as you get out of the US, it gets very difficult because of regulations. Yes. Any uh, thoughts about other ways to collect race, ethnicity? I, I know we can do it voluntarily, but uh, how, what's the best way for an organization to do that? Do you have a solution? No, go ahead. No, what I, what I, one thing I was going to say is, yes, laws and regulations require advocacy. And it's, it's continuing at the grassroots level to advocate for change of laws and regulations in order to get us where we need to be as a global society. The EU alone should be Yes. So any uh, parting words from our fabulous panelists? Just, um, just one sentence, like, what is it that one takeaway that you want everyone to leave from this room with? I, I think for me, um, I would just say, DNA can't be your destiny. That cannot be your destiny determinant. But I worry that data will become a destiny determinant unless we really think through how we're going to ensure that we build much more capability around data and data analytics. I would just say that um, you know, a lot of progress has been made over these last few years, but it's, it's distressing to know that so many companies, so many organizations have taken a step back from their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think today it's time to double down, not to step back. Amen. And Luana? And I think we are in Davos, and it's important to recognize the amazing work that WEF has been doing yes. um, with all the initiatives, but also the Alliance for Racial Equity. And I think it's important to also say that the launch of the Reskilling Revolution, the Good Work Alliance, all these initiatives that are really going to mobilize so many companies and create so many jobs, Reskilling Revolution, 1.1 billion uh, uh, people need to be trained. All of this need to be taught from a racial equity lens. We need to mainstream race into an ethnicity into all those programs. So whenever a company assume a commitment with that, such as the Good Work Alliance, which has a specific goal on diversity and inclusion, it's amazing. The, imp the potential impact that it could have via mainstreaming, not separating the issue, but integrating fully um, into all the initiatives, I think it will be a game changer. Well, thank you all. Thank the panelists for their wonderful participation. Thank all of you. And let's not let this conversation end.